so it goes. One of the most famous phrases in all of American literature comes from Kurt Vonnegut's Slaughterhouse-Five. So it goes. Very, very simple language, very, very complicated meaning. And I think that's a good metaphor for the novel, which is simple in ways. Much of what happens in Slaughterhouse-Five is very simple, very easy to grasp. But the meaning of it is extremely complex. And what he's doing is using the novel as a metaphor, using words as metaphors, to create a very rich and expressive idea that he wants to convey. And we'll get into those ideas in a few minutes. When it came out, uh, the book was shocking. Uh, it had a couple of dirty words in it. And it referenced, really, the World War II at a time when America was starting right into a new war, the Vietnam War. Uh, the novel has always been in print. Uh, it is very commonly read in America. It's one of the first adult novels that many people read, uh, including myself. And the novel, I think, carries a lot of power uh, for the statements that it wants to make. Uh, not only about war, but about humanity and the the troubles and the difficulties that humans get into, uh, war being one of those things. The novel was turned into a film, which became a kind of cult film, and was often shown on university campuses at uh, midnight showings. Uh, this is long before DVDs and uh, streaming on the computer. And it was really a favorite of young people. It was a book that young people read, young people felt strongly about, and that young people responded to. Uh, it's become a classic. It's a very short book. It's almost half of what many novels are, not just novels from 19th century, which tended to be really long, but novels from the 20th century. Uh, it's only 50,000 words, which is mm, about half, about 60% of what most novels are. And we'll look at the reasons why it's so short or can be so short uh, in a little while. America got into the Vietnam War uh, little by little, gradually, and it became a war which really split America, and I think that divide continues even today uh, between people who opposed the war, which was mainly young people, uh, educated people, uh, people in cities, and people that supported the war. Uh, which tended to be people in the countryside, people with less uh, education, people who were uh, working. And ironically, it's the working people that had to go and fight that war. Uh, the novel is about uh, Kurt Vonnegut's experience uh, during World War II. He was a prisoner of war. He was captured by the Germans and put into a prisoner of war camp. Uh, as you know, in World War II, uh, the Germans, both sides, uh, captured lots of people. But uh, America, towards the end of the war, wanted to, quote-unquote, hasten the end of the war, speed up the war. And one of the tactics they used was to firebomb cities. Tokyo, as you know, was firebombed, as were other parts of Japan. Uh, and in Germany, Dresden is one of the cities that was firebombed. Kurt Vonnegut was there. He saw it. He witnessed it. He was there after the bombs dropped. He survived, obviously. And as many people who survive war uh, feel, uh, they, they can't quite understand why did they survive? How, how could they be alive when all of these other people were killed uh, in terrible and horrible ways. And Slaughterhouse-Five is, I think, uh, his attempt to come to terms to understand his experience during the war. But if it was only that, 
the novel would really be autobiography and it wouldn't appeal to us. It would be interesting record of what happened. But what the brilliant genius part of the novel is, Kurt Vonnegut really takes his own experience and, and opens it up to connect to everything that's happened in America from World War II up until the 1960s, late 1960s, when he starts to write this novel and he sees once again that America is involved in another war, the Vietnam War. Is this novel an anti-war novel? Uh, Kurt Vonnegut brings up this question himself. He says he wants to write a novel about his experiences, but is he writing uh, an anti-war novel? Well, this is where the novel starts to get tricky because he says, no, it's not an anti-war novel. It's pointless to write an anti-war novel. There will always be wars. And he says, if there aren't wars, there's plain old death. So there's no escape. But when we read that, we, we have to keep in mind, and you need to keep this in mind as you read the novel, that he's being very ironic. What he says and what he really means is different. And whenever he makes a statement that kind of surprises you, like, ah, there are no anti-war novels, or you might as well write an anti-glacier novel, right? There's always glaciers, cold uh, movements of ice. He, he is being ironic. And when you read Slaughterhouse-Five, you have to keep in mind this idea of irony. He's trying to provoke us or push us a little bit uh, to think, to think for ourselves, to consider the issues, to consider the metaphors, to consider what he is saying, and think for ourselves. Irony is a great way to expand meaning, right? There's different kinds of irony, what somebody says and what they mean, what this person knows, but this person knows secretly that this person doesn't know. That's a kind of irony. So when you read Slaughterhouse-Five, you need to keep in mind there's lots of irony. The novel is also what we would call black comedy or dark comedy. And what that means is joking about something serious, right? Uh, this is also sometimes called gallows humor. Gallows is where people were hung. Uh, and if you can joke when you're about to die, that's, that's pretty good, right? But he's using this black comedy, very, very light, humorous commentary in order to make the sharpness of these serious topics, uh, and the novel brings up lots of serious things, right? There's war, there's death, there's suffering, there's sickness. He brings up these serious, serious topics not to make us laugh and stop thinking about it, to escape from it. Instead, he brings this up to make us feel and to consider the seriousness of it in a very new and very different way. So as you read, be sure to keep in mind the irony and black humor. Now, the first example we get of his irony is a kind of irony taken to the extreme which is absurdity, right? Absurdity is the idea that some things are so ridiculous, so foolish, so outrageous, we can't understand it. And I think overall, uh, the novel gives us that idea, the absurdity of war. Now, 
what do people think about that on their own? Well, that's what we need to think about. We can't say, it's absurd, so let's stop, or it's absurd, but mm, what can you do? It's always there. Well, of course, uh, most of us in the university are peace-loving people, or anti-war people, uh, and so we want to get a sense of his irony and absurdity that makes us think. And the first place he does that is on the title page. So if you have the book, uh, open up uh, the book to the very, very first page with the title and take a look. Uh, the title, of course, is Slaughterhouse Five, and the reason for the title will become clear uh, later on, uh, in, coincidentally, in Chapter Five out of ten chapters. And the subtitle is The Children's Crusade. Well, that's a pretty weird title, but the Children's Crusade is a real thing. It occurred in the Middle Ages. There were Crusades. Crusades were the Christian Europeans who went to fight against the Muslims, the believers in the Islamic faith, who had taken over the quote-unquote Holy Land, Jerusalem, Bethlehem, which is now part of uh, Israel. So the Children's Crusade is a real event in history, and he's, I think, saying that World War II is a kind of children's crusade. But look at the next line. He says, a duty dance with death. Well, that's a pretty weird title, too. A duty dance? Duty is obligation, right? Dance is free. How would that go together? Duty dance. Again, he's being ironic. He's confusing us or mm, kind of making us like, eh, what? Duty dance? What is that? And then he gives us death, which comes up again and again in the novel and connects to So It Goes. But let's keep reading the title page because it gets even more ridiculous by Kurt Vonnegut Jr., a fourth generation German-American now living in easy circumstances on Cape Cod and smoking too much, who, as an American infantry scout or de combat, as a prisoner of war, witnessed the firebombing of Dresden, Germany, the Florence of the Elba, a long time ago, and survived to tell the tale. This is a novel somewhat in the telegraphic, schizophrenic manner of tales of the planet Tralfamador, where the flying saucers come from. Peace. Well, <laughs> you don't get title pages like that very often, right? Most title pages are pretty uh, simple, right? Just the name of the book, name of the author. But here, he gives us a uh, history. He was in the war. He tells us about Dresden, this beautiful city in Germany, uh, the place where much uh, part of the novel takes place. He tells us that he's comfortable now, he's safe, he's alive. And then he brings up the Tralfamadorians, these people from outer space. He makes up this other uh, set of aliens, right? This other race, I guess, of aliens that come to America. And uh, on flying saucers. I'm not sure if you believe in flying saucers, but uh, I haven't seen one yet. So the title page is like the clue, hey, wake up. This is going to be a very strange story with lots of weird stuff mixed in. And to read it, you're going to need a sense of humor, a sense of irony, and you're going to have to look things up that you don't know. If you look up Tralfamador, <laughs> it doesn't exist, except in this novel. But if you look up everything else, Cape Cod, uh, Dresden, uh, Florence of the Elba, and if you look up Kurt Vonnegut, of course, all of those things really exist. Now, another strange thing in this novel is what's called authorial intrusion. That means the author, the writer, in 
intrudes, goes into the novel. And this is a little different from first person, I, right? But uh, the first chapter, like the title page, the first chapter and the tenth chapter of the novel are both written in first person with I, from his point of view, from Kurt Vonnegut's point of view. He says, I, I witnessed, I saw, I was there. And this idea of I is very important because, you know, we tend to believe eyewitness accounts. Right? Did you see it? If you saw it, that's different from, ah, nah, I just, I just heard about it, or I read about it, or I saw it on the internet, right? Those are very secondhand ways of knowing or experiencing. But this is a novel which, of course, includes many of those things, books, before the internet, of course, but includes books, it includes stories, it includes many, many aspects. But his use of I, of first person, is very, very important because it gives us a kind of reality check. And this becomes one of the themes, of course, of the story. And we're reading a novel which is not autobiography, but is really about something that happened. He creates a character, Billy Pilgrim, the main character, who is a very unique character because he does almost nothing. He floats through the novel, uh, he doesn't really take action, and he survives the war and becomes rich after the war. Now, we often say a character is the writer's alter ego, right? It's like another I, a kind of representative of the author. But I'm not sure if that's the case in Slaughterhouse-Five. We can discuss that, and we will discuss that um, as we go through the novel. But the I is important because it also sounds like the other word, I, right? E Y E. And by chance, the main character, Billy Pilgrim, is an optometrist who creates glasses. Now, this is an important image, too, because what the novel wants to do is to help us see better, to look better, to be able to really visualize what happened with the bombing of Dresden and to see something more, see something bigger. The aliens that are running through the novel, the Tralfambadorians, we never see them, we hear them. But the Tralfambadorians are very, very special. And we'll talk about the Tralfambadorians in a minute. As you read the novel, don't confuse the main character, Billy Pilgrim, with the author. They're, they're different. There's maybe some correspondence in some ways. They're both there in Dresden. But the eye is important because it gives us a different way of thinking about the novel, a different way of thinking about what happens in the novel. Um, now, the Tralfemidorians are kind of these fantastic creatures because they're better uh, than us humans. They're better in this way. Uh, of course, they can travel through time. They can see all time. So humans are, compared to the Tralfamidorians, rather weak creatures, right? Here on Earth, we live in the moment. We can remember the past. We can imagine the future, but we're stuck in the moment. And uh, the novel reminds us of our being trapped by saying we are bugs in amber. We're like a bug that's stuck inside the tree sap, the amber, and you know we can't move from moment to moment. From this moment to this moment, it seems like we're moving. But our life is kind of, in a way, like a, a, 
a movie, right? We're always like, chink, one small bit of time that we can see. Now, I don't like to give tests very often, and certainly not in the middle of a lecture, but what, here's your question, here's a big test, what is the most common noun in English? Any guesses? Most common noun is time. It is the word that's used most often in English. Other words that are used very commonly are day, that's in the top 10, year, that's also in the top 10. Now, why is that, right? Well, the novel brings up not just war, but this idea of time, and it wants us to open our mind to think about time in a much bigger, much broader way. The Trout Famidorians are kind of geniuses because they can see, they see everything that happens, right? We tend to view life going forward, but the Trout Famidorians see all of time, all the time. That's a pretty weird idea, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. The main character, Billy Pilgrim, has become, quote, unstuck in time. So what that means is, unlike us, he jumps around in time. And this makes the novel very confusing because Billy Pilgrim is in the middle of the war, then he jumps to the 1960s when he's rich. Then he jumps back to his childhood, then back to the war, then to the future, then to the back. And he keeps jumping back and forth. Well, how would that be for a life? Well, we always think, ah, oh, time travel, that would be great. But for Billy Pilgrim, time travel is kind of a nightmare. He never knows where he's going to be. He never knows why. He never knows where he's going to be next. He jumps in time. The Tralfamidorians help to explain this to Billy Pilgrim. But when we read the novel, be careful. You've got to take really good notes and pay attention to where Billy is. Usually it says, back in 1944, and that's in the middle of the war, or back to Billy's childhood, so we know it's in his childhood, or we get some hint or a clue where we are in the novel. But as you read the novel, it jumps around in time Again, to make us think, to make us feel, to make us wonder about how that happens. Now, that confusion, again, is not inhuman because most of us don't live in the present moment. We're always worrying about something from yesterday or we're worrying about something for tomorrow. Most humans are kind of like Billy Pilgrim, they're jumping around in time. Their brain is in the past or their brain is in the present. And that makes Billy Pilgrim very human, deeply human, in some ways one of the most human characters of any novel you'll ever read. The novel is also confusing because it refers to many different things. Um, there's a fancy word for this, which is called intertextuality. Inter is between, text is any book, right? And the novel really refers to a huge number of other stories. So it's a story inside a story, or a story inside a story inside a story. And I think the novel is really intriguing because it brings up so many fantastic stories. It goes back to the Bible, uh, Adam and Eve, uh, the story of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, Lot's wife. Uh, it goes to uh, the Middle East, Scheherazade, uh, Tales of Arabian Nights, A Thousand and One Nights. 
Uh, it goes to stories of the war, of civil war, of World War I. Uh, it brings in all of these references and allusions to both real people, uh, like President Truman, who dropped the atomic bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, approved that, and it refers to uh, the characters inside books, right? It also refers to the story of Cinderella, which I think is kind of a basic story in humankind. And if you haven't seen the Disney version of Cinderella, uh, take a little time and look up um, the story of Cinderella because the novel Slaughterhouse-Five is really built on or kind of rests on this bed of other famous stories. Well, so is this an anti-war novel? We have to think about that as we go all the way through. And I think almost everybody will probably say in some way, yes, this is an anti-war novel. But what does that mean, right? We tend to sometimes think very simply for or against, pro, con. But with something as complex as the war, any war, ongoing wars, we have to really think what does that mean to be anti-war? And I think the novel is a kind of meditation on what that could mean. What does it mean to be anti-war? What does it mean to be against war? What does it mean to think that war is terrible and awful and the worst thing uh, that can happen? And the novel gives us a chance to think through that. Now, that's a little bit different from other kinds of novels. Uh, as I said before, there's, there's strange references, uh, there's lots of irony, uh, the, there's many different kinds of characters, and each of the characters is kind of uh, symbolic of an idea. And the novel wants to kind of be more of a guide to thinking and wondering about things than it is just telling us a story. It's a different kind of novel, and Slaughterhouse-Five, we can say, is a novel of ideas. It's trying to bring up the idea of war, the idea of the causes of war, the results of war, the reasons for war, what does war do, what does it produce, what does it result in. But the novel doesn't just stop there, it really connects the idea of war to lots of other ideas. The one idea I mentioned before is about time. How do we think of time? We, we often think of, ah, oh, it's in the past, or, oh, that's over, or, ah, I'll worry about it when it happens. But we know that history, right, is a kind of record of the past and there's a very famous phrase which is history is written by the victors victors means the winners so whoever wins the war is the ones put in charge of writing up the story or the history of the war the novel wants to put history and story in terms story meaning a novel, uh, kind of side by side. There's lots of history that happens. We get Dresden, we get World War I, World War II, uh, all of these events going back in time even further to uh, Rome, all the way back to uh, the first record in the West, uh, the Bible, recording many different events that happened. So we know that the novel is trying to get us to think about these things, right? What, how is that connected? How is the present connected to the past? 
And our idea of time and what time is, how does time work, uh, is very important to understanding the past and the present and the future, but also uh, in terms of understanding what war is, right? And who we are as people, as human beings on this planet. Uh, we have other ideas in the novel which comes up. He brings up lots of ideas. Time is connected to the idea of free will or choice. Do we choose who we are or do we not choose? Is it determined by the past? Is war determined by things that happened before? Or is war a choice that people, countries make? This is two different ideas about war, right? War is eh, shogunai, it's inevitable, we can't avoid it. Or war is something that humans choose to do, right? Well, we know the difference from our everyday life. Uh, if we're forced to do something, or if we choose to do something, those are very, very different things. And so the novel brings up the idea of war, time, free will, determinism, and all of that, I think, all of these big ideas about how do we tell a story, how do we tell or write history also comes around or comes up to a couple of other big ideas um, which is truth and humanity. Now those are big words, right? And the idea of truth is a very tricky one. Uh, in this novel, as, as in life, uh, we, we don't always know what's true, right? We're often confused or unsure about what the truth is, right? Uh, but this novel really wants us to think which is more true, history or a novel. Well, history is supposed to be facts, and a novel is supposed to be made up fiction. But is that true? Think back to your high school textbooks. Are those textbooks true exactly? And, for that matter, could any history be completely true? If we write a history of World War II from a soldier's point of view, from a general's point of view, from a, a producer of military weapons point of view, from a woman's point of view, from a child's point of view. <laughs> Which one is true? All of them are or none of them are, but for various different reasons. And I think the novel is really gripping because it really challenges us to think, how do we know what's true? The novel puts that question into an even bigger question, which is, what's the nature of humanity, of humans? What qualities make us human? What qualities define us as human beings? And this idea of humanism, that humans are kind of the center of everything, a famous phrase, Man is the measure of all things. Now, uh, sorry women, I don't think he's cutting women out, but man used to refer to men and women together uh, as humans. So humans are the measure of all things. What that means is humans are kind of central, uh, and we can agree with that or disagree with that, and we're trying to think of whether to agree with that or disagree with that and why. The novel, I think, is a great novel because it's very humanistic. It rests on a positive idea of humanity. So, at one point when, in the novel, when the Tralfamadorians are talking with Billy Pilgrim, uh, Billy Pilgrim says, well, it seems like you don't believe in the idea of free will, right? The choice of humans. And the Tralfamadorians say this, they say, If I hadn't spent so much time studying earthlings, said the Tralfamadorian, I wouldn't have any idea what was meant by free will. 
I've visited 31 inhabited planets in the universe, and I've studied reports on 100 more. Only on Earth is there any talk of free will. Well, again, Vonnegut's being ironic. Of course we believe in free will. We believe in this idea of choice, right? And the novel, I think, puts that idea forward. It really puts this concept of humans as being capable of making choices, making good choices, making better choices about what happens on the earth. This idea, I think, is one of the most important ideas. And as we read the novel and it comes up again and again and again, almost on every page we're asked, what's a human? Is this human? What's the most human thing? And we know that there's terrible things and wonderful things, both. So humanity is one of the central focuses of this novel. And I think uh, Kurt Vonnegut is really trying to get us to rethink what, what human beings are, what makes us human, what defines us as human. And he brings up all these ideas about time and success and how we act in war. And this is kind of an old idea about war, that war is really the test of your humanity. Uh, put in the worst conditions, most terrible conditions. And what would you do? How do you do? That's your real test. The novel, I think, is very humanistic by trying to get us to think about humans and the things we do, the great things we do, and the terrible things we do. So if this novel is an anti-war novel, on the flip side, we might say it's a pro-human novel, that it makes us think about what humanity can do well, what is its magnificent creations. So that's the pro side of the novel. So as you read the novel, you need to read in a new and different way. This isn't just a story. Uh, a story is a series of questions, and Kurt Vonnegut asks us lots and lots of questions all the way through. He asks us, what's human? What's time? What's war? Can we stop war? What's success? What is America? It's a very American novel. And the novel, I think, is not just about World War II, not just about the firebombing of Dresden. That would be enough for any novel. But it's really about lots and lots of big ideas. So as you read the novel, you need to read in a little bit different way. Remember to think about irony all the time. Keep track of who says what. Look at each page and see what's the question there. The novel is divided into almost like 100 uh, separate small sections. Some of them is a page, some of them is two pages. Each small section seems disconnected, seems not connected to the next section, but it's connected. You have to connect that. The reader has to bring all that together, and uh, that's a lot of work. So this novel, I think, even though it's shorter than most novels, demands us, it, it forces us as a reader to do some work. We can't just read along and say, oh, this is nice, oh, it's a wonderful little story, oh, it's beautiful. We have to think and we have to make connections, we have to remember things. Uh, and I think because of that, uh, the novel is really fascinating, very different from other types of novels that are quote-unquote just stories. And uh, every year teaching this uh, novel, I really find uh, people are completely confused by this. And I, I felt the same way when I read it the first time. But as we read and reread and get into the novel, and we'll also watch the film, we start to have this bigger vision, this bigger idea of what 
uh, what humans are and how humans are put on the earth and, and what our purpose might be. And the novel, I think, really asks us to think about these things because the novel respects us as readers and respects our intelligence and respects our ability to make great choices.